Thank you. And do you even think, uh, first of all, I apologize, my voice is, I don't have a voice. I've been having a bad cold for a couple weeks and I still have a stuffy nose. Um, so I'm continuing the theme about medical robotics. Um, I'm going to just want to switch directions and talk a bit about different um, work that we have been doing. Um, we have been working on uh, this idea of simulation-based, and really, more correctly, it's image-based, guided um, joint estimation of body definitions and elasticity parameters for healthcare robots. Um, in particular, why are we interested in this problem? Uh, we actually started doing this uh, because we need to do some medical industry registrations. And I have actually, uh, around the same time, you know, my father was was diagnosed uh, prostate cancer. So it's sort of kind of, you know, congruence of things that was happening that really got me interested in this problem. So I started looking into cancer, and we found that um, cancer screening is not as advanced as we thought it would happen because a lot of time, early stage cancer screening is pretty much done by our patients um, and blood tests. As it turned out, blood test result can be um, very unreliable. And, um, and sometimes it's sort of over alarming and sometimes it's under um, diagnosing the, the, the condition of the patient. Um, so one of the things that what we know of is that cancerous tissue, they tend to be stiff. It doesn't mean all the stiff tissues are cancerous, however. But at least it's a good indication for something that we need to kind of watch out. So that's sort of kind of how the doctor start uh, diagnosing some of the patients, just feel in touch. Um, I actually have been one of the patients for breast cancer as well, and it was a false alarm, simply because the doctor was not experienced enough. But the process that you have to go through, once you, you have been identified as a cancer patient, it's really agonizing. So what we're trying to do is try to see if there are better methods with all the compute power and all the data that we have, can we actually do something smarter other than just feeling and touching or do just purely blood tests? So this is just a perspective of adding one more piece of data to this very, very tough problem. Um, so other people have, of course, thought about this idea. And this process is of the cancer screening trying to determine what, you know, using the idea of tissue property. It's usually done, um, for example, by using what people call a elastography process. Essentially what it does is you, you take a device, you apply forces, and then you see how much the tissue have indented, having displaced. And then from there, you can get the tissue properties. Normally you can do this, um, you know, in places where you can easily acquire that kind of information. But not all the organs inside of your body can actually be so easily accessible. Um, and prostate was one of them. So we have, and in addition to that, the importance of tissue property is beyond cancer screening or staging. Um, if you want to do cancer treatment, one of the things that you might want to look at is actually track how your tissue change over time and usually a treatment image is taken on the day of treatment and some sort of planning images is taken in advance. And so you are trying to do image registration using such images. The current existing technique is mostly based on geometric method which is only matching the boundary but not worry about the internal too much. And there are some issues with that. Um, so one of the things that one alternative is to use physically based <coughs> then you can really deform the whole entire organ, not just the boundary. Now, if you want to pursue such an approach, then you need to think about what are the patient's specific tissue properties. Because without that property, you cannot get your simulation correct. And so that really it was what essentially motivated all these problems that, that got us there. So in addition to that, if we are working on medical robots, and I know many, many groups are working on medical robots over the year, Allison uh, is one of them. Um, for example, amino insertions. Um, my colleague, uh, Ron Altruvis, um, has been looking at designing concentric tube robots. A lot of time, you need to design these robots just sort of kind of by trying errors, um, and then you experiment on animal tissue 
Certainly, simulator will be an other way trying to experiment that in advance, especially if you have patients with different kind of tissue properties. And in fact, tissue properties can vary quite a bit um, between patients or even within the same patients. Most of people don't realize we human body consists in most of water. So just by different hydration level, your tissue property can vary quite a bit. So if you have a technique that can extract the tissue property of human, then there are tremendous amount of possibility that you can apply not just to design prototyping, but procedure planning, uh, patient specific procedure planning, surgical, simulator, and even rehab. For example, imagine you do the same thing for joints, uh, for biomechanical property, and like some of the work that Virginia is doing at Berkeley. So this whole idea of trying to get patient-specific parameters is really a way uh, that we need to think about as a community because I think if we really are talking about healthcare robots, we need to treat each patient individually as they are um, and, and look at these, some of these very challenging problems. Okay, so for us, it was a problem of elasticity. How do you do elastography? How do you determine these patient-specific properties? So I'm going to focus on just these two problems and just kind of give you, this is an ongoing project and the second phase right now is supported by a joint program by NSF and NIH, the Smart Information Health Program. Um, but I'll just kind of give you some overview of what we have done without going into all the detail. <laughs> okay, so what we did here was essentially, we have taken essentially a set of images and um, we are assuming that we have at least two sets of images. One set of images very likely is prior to anything was done, which we call the reference images or the planning images. And then we use that set of images um, compared against the images just during the treatment or right, or right before the treatment. Um, and then, or, or just from another time. By looking at the two sets of images, because these are mostly 3D images, um, we can actually reconstruct the geometry meshes for that organ. And then what we need to do is, based on these two sets of images, automatically extract the tissue property from there. So you're gonna ask me how do we do it? Actually, it's a not easy problem. Um, for those of you who have worked on the inverse problem, you know very well this is an extremely tough problem. Well, an inverse problem in general is an extremely tough problem. And that's why that a lot of people started looking at data-driven modeling, um, in, you know, more from an interpolation perspective, because it's it, it just a hard problem. Um, and we have been working on this for a few years. I, I have to say, you know, it's sometimes there are the hair pulling moment. Why didn't it work? Uh, and but but we have some, you know, results which are very promising. This is earlier work that was already published at actively transaction or medical imaging. So what we have here is this simulation optimization couple framework. Um, what we have is we have some sort of initial guesses of tissue property, and that's usually some sort of default values. And we reconstruct the forces based on the images um, of the surrounding organ. So we calculate the displacement of the surrounding organ, and we use that differences to set the boundary forces to drive our simulations. Then we also have some sort of, we also calculate some sort of distance map for the organ because we need that for our simulation. Um, then we run the FEM simulations. Uh, this earlier work we use, we actually have two models, the linear model and the linear model. But the linear model works a lot better than the linear model. And then we come up with some sort of objective functions. The objective function that we currently have considered uh, essentially are looking at sort of the boundary of the organ or the boundary of the tumor and how they sort of match with each other. So it's a very much a three-dimensional surface matching kind of problem. And, and then we come up with an optimization technique uh, to solve that problem by trying to minimize that, the, the differences between the two organ boundary so that they would align. And infrequently we would update the parameters by minimizing the differences or minimizing the objective function. So it goes on and on in a loop until it converges. What is P? I'm sorry. Yeah, those are parameters. What are 
Um, so what we have, depending on what you have, um, that is essentially the gas modulus. Gas modulus. So that's essentially gas modulus. So we, um, if you use a linear model, then you would have different sets of parameters. Um, so it pretty much depending on, but the general framework actually works, I believe, in the outside of what we have done. Um, and so this is going into a little bit of detail. Uh, usually what we have started with is CD images. And these are not very high quality images. In fact, uh, we could also use MRI images, but we have not done that because we were working with predominantly prostate shit to start with, prostate cancer patients to start with. So we have these very kind of you know, low resolution CD images. We built a surface 3D surface mesh for the whole entire organ and, and the surrounding area. Then we tetrahedralize the whole entire human body, uh, generate uh, uh, metric meshes, and then we perform the deformation simulation for the whole entire regions. So you can see this is actually pretty involved, it's computationally, um, you know, each step is it's a challenge by itself, and that's one of the reasons that I say it's, it's not so easy, but we have actually got the whole entire system to work. Um, and as I already mentioned, the boundary forces are essentially calculated based on the displacement of the nearby tissue. That was our objective functions, and again, this is written in a very abstract form, but essentially it's the boundary surface difference of the two organ prior and uh, uh, from, the head, from the reference organ and from the current default organ. Um, for this particular work, we actually use a quasi optimization. Um, and usually iterated through a few times and it would eventually converge. I want to apologize, this was cut and paste on PDF, um, but I, I'll read this to you. We have actually tested on the scenarios and we have seen uh, 50 is a reasonably normal, healthy um, tissues. 100 is you already have cancer. When you get to 150, it's very rich and very stiff. You are in a very advanced stage of cancer. Um, so we have found that this algorithm, as we expected, are sensitive to the parameters, um, as, but we are still pretty happy and pretty pleased with the overall errors that we got. Um, it's, it's about 1 to 2% when, when it's even just reasonably uh, within between 50 to 100. Um, even when you get to 150, it's very advanced. Even if we're off a little bit, it really didn't matter as much because at that point, you, you are you are very, very sick, right? So it's very stiff. Um, and so even if we're off by a little bit, it's, it's already in that category. But given the time constraint, I, I see my signals. Um, we have done this on 10 patients, 180 data sets. And we look at their clinical um, T stage, which is their cancer stage. And then we plot it using this, this plot diagram, trying to see if there's actually some sort of correlation. Are we onto something? What we found really interestingly was this is three different T stage and it actually has a substage in here, but this is just to show the general trend. Much easier, um, this is a box plot to kind of show you the general idea. But you can see what we have found is a very significant linear correlation between the tissue property and the cancer stage. Um, so that's where we work just for, um, for one organ pro uh, property estimation. We can move on. And we have moved on to do simultaneous estimation of tissue property for multiple organs and multiple regions. And what this means is that we are actually now calculating different regions that have different tissue. Potentially, what this can do is even giving us a subregion within the same organ. And it, it is in fact what it is doing. Um, we have switched to different methods. Um, we are using much more sophisticated linear model material. And, um, and so we have a very similar framework going on just to talk a bit about, show you some of the results. We got even better results than what we had before. And uh, this is just looking at a prostate cancer staging, same sets of data. Uh, we actually have even better results based, uh, based on the, T, the P value. Um, and so we were very, very excited about, about what, what is here. And we are certainly going on and doing more work, um, but just to kind of give you some idea. So this is good for medical education. 
uh, for different stiffness value, you can see the, the organs actually behave a little bit differently when you drop them, and you don't want to repeat this experiment at all. Don't want to drop the organs onto the dish. <laughs> but you could certainly also, by looking at different patients with different parameters, and if you try to poke it, you could actually see the slight different deformations. It's very subtle, but it's a good way of us imagine that you can actually develop a, uh, a surgical simulator to allow the, um, the surgeon to go in there and poke and start cutting and a whole bunch of things. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to end it right there and come back to um, the top. So I just kind of give you a glance of what you can do, because uh, I don't have a lot of time. So the surprise is that we have now a general framework for estimating the vulnerable material directly from images uh, and, and be able to um, perform some sort of correlation for cancer staging. We are also doing cancer grading as well. Um, now, it's kind of the only issue is we want to do actually a large scale clinical study because we want to see this going, going out there to be used. And we certainly need to, need to perform more foundations uh, as well as extending more out on this idea of, of estimating simultaneously multiple regions of different tissue property at the same time. Now, I, I do want to say, you know, especially following the sessions right before uh, us on um, the multi agent simulation systems, I, I do want to say that I think it is critical that we think about some of these problems because we do a lot of these simulations and we do a lot of these um, designs of robots. Um, one of the things is that I, I actually will also work on cross simulations and we're talking about cross annealing. Um, we, I also work on reconstruction of traffic directly from data sets. Uh, these, are, these are small scale, so we, uh, this is actually a small scale robot right now. Uh, those are robots. Um, so they, they just try to coordinate, move around each other, avoid each other. Um, so I just show you. But we have also been very recently looking at insect swamp simulations because there is a lot of excitement regarding biologically inspired robots. And before we can really take advantage of what the biology, biology is telling us and the intelligence on the natures, we also want to be able to try to see if we can model them. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is if we can simulate large scale crop, then we can have design better robot, human robot uh, systems so the robot can interact with crops. And the reason is because you want to be able to predict how people move and how you interact with them. So having that motion model help you design by the robot to interact with people. And especially if you want to do crowd control, um, you know, you want large scale, this is the kind of things that we were trying to uh, capture. Uh, that was on the National Geographic images of footages. This is what our simulator do. And this, we're talking about a million people there on the campground. Um, this one right here is about a quarter million. Uh, this is also from National Geographic. Uh, and you can see how the crowd moved around makeup. And this is really a childish scenario because it just packed the people. The simulation runs in real time. Okay, and we're trying to model not just the human movement, but also interaction between agents. Um, we're looking at these crowds, human crowd as also an agent. Similarly, um, I would say that as we think about designing autonomous ground vehicle, as we push forward this idea that we're going to have autonomous driver, autonomous robot driver, driving the thing, we still are going to have human drivers. And so how do we take advantage of existing information that we have, which is everywhere. Sensor data is everywhere, on the ground, on the highway, on the city, on the camera. Can we take advantage of that data and be able to help us extrapolate information, be able to visualize it? And so we have actually done some of these work. So if you can visualize it, if you can extrapolate the information, you certainly can design better robot, uh, ground robot, to be able to route better. And that's kind of one, some of the idea that we have. We actually call it participatory, participatory route planning. Is that you, as a driver, or possibly a robot um, driver, want to be able to take advantage of the information that we already have on the highway, be able to predict into the future, and then be able to take that information to take it into account of how you do the planning. Everything you see here, this is the real satellite images, real GIS data, the, the traffic that you have seen here um, on one side is actually real traffic 
that was automatically reanimated by just simply animating the data that we have at fixed point. So we were able to reconstruct the traffic flow. The other one is simply simulation. So anyone can guess which one is which? I'm sorry. The next slide is simulation. The, the next slide. The further one. The further one is simulation. Yep. Yeah. Richard, that is great. <laughs> the you, you see it enough, right? So, yes, that, that is true. And uh, what I want to say was we will actually be able to even capture HDL length behaviors, which is pretty, uh, pretty good because we thought we weren't sure can we really do what we hope that we will do. Lastly, I want to kind of end it right here with the inside swap simulation. And this is an other data-driven simulation. Uh, we've been looking at how can we actually learn from nature. And um, without going into all the detail, uh, it is a data-driven approach and is biologically inspired. What you see is the four different techniques. And this is ours, and this is the real data. The data was captured courtesy of the <coughs> university. Uh, they actually equipped every single one of those insects so they can get their trajectory. I mean, I don't know how to do it, but it's amazing. Um, so we take, we capture the data, we look at what they, what we have with the real data and what was being calculated, what we are able to simulate. Um, of course, the, our approach is grid-based approach. So we look at different grid sizes and we found that ours is a purple, the real data is blue. Our data, our approach is the closest to what the data simulation is able to give us. So we were pretty excited compared to other approach. Um, so I'm just going to show you. So this is just showing that our approach can be incorporated with any kind of motion planning algorithm. So it is already incorporated. Uh, you can see that the, the light was on, the ASA was being attracted to the light. So as a different light was off, they're attracted to a different light source automatically. So we see this really, really interesting behaviors. <coughs> and just a sort of can be sketching. Uh, I mean, this is high, I can be just to show you that this was a simulation of insect swarm along the land and um, going forward, ending it right here. Um, if we are looking at the weather, I know we got much better weather here in Texas, but looking forward to tomorrow. I know the sun will be out, and this is what we will see if you go on campus. Okay, I'm going to end right here.
to learn from the nature, to learn from the human, you know, or just to be able to learn from the sensory data that's around us everywhere. Okay. Thank you.